Hello everybody, welcome to the MD82 Masterclass series. I am your host, Mustafa. Uh, you can find me streaming regularly over on Twitch, but uh, here on YouTube I like to do a couple of uh, tutorial videos, and uh, this series is going to be my first one that really goes super in-depth on the, uh, the MD80, my, my favorite aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator at this moment, time of filming. Uh, so we're going to start out uh, in this module, this is module number one, and this is going to be kind of an introduction to the aircraft and uh, speaking specifically about the load manager, how to get liveries set up and all that. So if you're already very familiar with all of that, you can go ahead and skip on to the next video. They're all going to be in, in order here. We're going to go all the way through the cockpit familiarization and uh, takeoff and FMC setup and all that stuff is all going to be in other videos that are uh, coming after this one. So. Uh, for right now, we're going to talk about the uh, the MD-80 as a whole. It is a twin-engine uh, airliner built by McDonnell Douglas, and uh, as you can see here, we're parked on the ramp in Las Vegas. The uh, engines are unique in the sense that they sit on the very back of the of the tail here. They're not mounted in pods like a lot of other airliners under the wings, and uh, this makes for a, a necessary T-tail configuration on the aircraft as well, which provides some interesting handling characteristics. The aircraft is very long and slender. It's uh, five seats abreast inside and, uh, and uh, was a favorite of a number of airlines, especially American, uh, in, a, in a very similar role to that of the 737. The aircraft, while not being in service really anymore, uh, you might find them in some uh, more third world countries, but uh, outside of the United States, uh, for sure, uh, they're not used here in the States anymore, basically because of fuel efficiency and noise. Uh, these JT-8Ds provided uh, quite a bit of uh, noise and are not nearly as efficient as the uh, newer engines of today. So uh, this is a historic airplane. The avionics inside, you can uh, have a number of options. We're gonna go over those in a moment. Uh, but it is uh, somewhat glass, although uh, very early glass, and I will see some examples of that. It is fully integrated with GSX, which is a very cool uh, plus if you have GSX. So ground services are um, very well integrated, as well as uh, loading and unloading through GSX. You don't have to use GSX. If you don't have it, you can still operate this aircraft, don't worry. Uh, but uh, if you do have GSX, you can take it up to that level of immersion. Let's go ahead and get on the uh, flight deck. But before we do, I do want to just talk about a couple of limitations with the aircraft as far as stuff. This is all stuff you'll find in your manual. In fact, everything I'm going to go over today in these videos is all found in your manual. But it's good to just kind of have some of these numbers uh, in your head when you're flying this aircraft uh, to know. And uh, so we're just going to go over some of the, uh, the things for this aircraft. So the max altitude, most airliners today, the max altitude is 41,000 feet. Uh, this one is actually only certified up to 37,000 feet. So your, your highest you're ever going to go in this aircraft, 37,000. And you don't necessarily need to go there. Uh, most of your flying in this aircraft will probably be down the low 30s and high 20s. Uh, max takeoff and landing altitude is 8,500. That's fairly common for most airliners. Uh, we don't need to really worry about the uh, the temperatures. You can find those in your uh, in your manual. Um, max operating speed is uh, is um, 0.84 Mach for this aircraft. Again, you're probably rarely going to get near that, but uh, that is the uh, the max certified there. Uh, max in turbulent is uh, 0.79 Mach, and those translate into uh, knots as 340 knots and 285 knots, respectfully. Uh, max takeoff uh, for a tail, uh, sorry, max takeoff and landing tailwind is going to be about 10 knots. And again, that's pretty common for most airliners as well. You have a max uh, crosswind limit uh, if you have manual rudder of 25 knots, auto land 15 knots, uh, restricted rudder travel 12 knots, and um, if you've got uh, really low uh, visibility, um, then it's uh, 10 knots. So crosswind limits there. Uh, max takeoff landing crosswind component for a dry runway 30 knots, wet runway 20 knots, and for an icy runway 12 knots. And then uh, for weights, maximum takeoff weight for the, and we're talking about the 82 variant. There are the 83 and the 88 variants that are available from Leonardo. We're going to speak about those later, but this tutorial is focused on the 82. Uh, maximum takeoff weight is 149,500 pounds. Max zero fuel weight, 121,999 pounds. It can carry 39,132 pounds of fuel, a max uh, passenger complement of 162, and uh, you can get 12,147 pounds in the forward cargo and uh, 6,636 in the aft. 
So there you go. Just some numbers. Again, all those numbers are in the manual that come with the aircraft. So that's just some stuff to have in the back of your mind as an introduction to the aircraft. Let's go ahead and get over into the aircraft itself. All right, so here we find ourselves uh, kind of near the entrance to the flight deck. Uh, the uh, door is closed at the moment. There are some knobs here that you can manipulate for uh, changing the cabin lighting. Uh, you will notice uh, in the cabin the uh, textures are not uh, the highest of quality, and this is one of the strikes that Leonardo gets, uh, this and the sounds that come with it by default. So um, now again, for me, I don't really care. I don't spend a lot of time in the passenger cabin, uh, but it would be nice at some point to get a, a kind of a higher resolution uh, texture pack for this. Uh, the cockpit is where it all matters, where all the magic happens, and they are better than this. Although some uh, complaints can be found, and, and there's reason for some of those. Uh, but uh, there are some mods that take and kind of make some more uh, 4K version textures of the cockpit elements, and you can get those on flightsim.to. So we're not going to really worry about that. But uh, you can manipulate the, um, the knobs there. The door, uh, you can manipulate by through the uh, tablet. Uh, you can't just pick up the handle here, but uh, you can walk through the cockpit fully. I'm not going to go ahead and do that, but uh, it's, uh, it's not too bad for a, uh, for, a modeled, uh, for a modeled cabin. All right, where the magic happens in the flight deck. And so we're just going to talk about uh, kind of uh, overview location of some of the things you need to be aware of uh, as we get started here. Uh, the most important is going to be the tablet or the EFB. If you don't have this in your aircraft, you need to go into the load manager and activate it. Um, you don't need to fly with it. Some people prefer not to use a tablet on these older aircraft, but uh, then all of your uh, tablet duties would either be need to be done in the load manager itself or on your FMC down here. Um, as far as the rest of it, we're going to go through a, uh, in a more comprehensive cockpit layout as to where everything is. I know it looks like a big uh, confusing mess right now, but uh, suffice to say, most things are normally where they go. You've got the tiller over here for nose wheel steering. You have your standard instruments for your, uh, for your first officer, captain or first officer. It's a yoke airplane. Obviously, your throttle's in the middle. It has uh, two FMCs. You do have the option for uh, the uh, Honeywell FMCs or the old school uh, Canadian Marconi and uh, PMS FMC, which adds another device back here where this blank spot is. And we will go over both of those uh, in this tutorial series, so don't worry, we will cover both. And uh, I'm a big fan, actually, of the Marconi. It's a really fun way to fly this bird. Uh, but I think that's really all we need to talk about for just kind of the cockpit overview. The circuit breakers back here are not uh, functional, uh, but the circuit breakers up here are. Uh, so these ones can be pulled, these ones can pop, uh, but uh, the rest of them are not. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, shuffle on over into the captain's seat. And the lion's share of this tutorial is going to be talking about this guy right here, and that is the load manager. Now, there is uh, two schools of thought to using this, first of all, and the, so you're going to get my opinion. And that is, if you use the EFB, you should not need to really open this ever, except for when you first do your settings, and we're going to go over those. After that, do everything in the EFB and load your aircraft that way. Do not try to use loading through the EFB and through the load manager. They will kind of fight with each other and you're going to have weights set funny and it's not going to end well. So uh, pick one, stick with it. There's no right or wrong way, but use one of them and don't use them both. So, uh, But to set up things, we do need to use this initially. So the first screen you get here, and again, this is assuming you have gone in and you have activated your product, which is done in the little key down here. If you have not done that, go get your registration code from your uh, emails and, and wherever you bought the airplane, probably Sim Market, because I think that's the only place it's available. And uh, make sure you uh, register the product so you unlock everything fully. Uh, you have some buttons up here, print. Uh, this is a save and sync. This is a save and exit, and this is just an exit without saving. I don't really know why you would need to be printing much of this stuff, but if you are tied to your printer, you can do that. Uh, save and sync is what I like to use so it doesn't close the thing until I'm really ready to close it. Um, but I can save it and, and update options. And you can update options on the fly. So I can make changes here right now, and it will, for instance, let me change the, um, the FMS. So right now you can see down here we have the, uh, the Honeywell FMS. And if I hit save and sync and I just changed it to the Canadian PMS, it changed it right there. So you can do these changes on the fly. So if you realize you loaded in and, oh, it's not set up right, don't 
exit the simulator and come back. You don't have to do that. You can do it all and update on the fly. Don't worry. Uh, but that's save and sync. I could do the same thing by hitting save and exit, but then it would exit the, uh, the load manager. I don't want to do that. Okay. At the very top here, you're going to get the installed version. Right now, uh, on the time of this recording, it's 1.2 uh, Bravo 169, and it's telling me the installed version is up to date, which is helpful because then I know this is the current one. It'll also show all the variants that I have installed, and whichever one I have selected here is what's going to kind of show me options for going forward. So we're going to be on the MD82. And uh, the liveries manager is where you can install liveries. Now, unfortunately, the liveries, the way you install liveries, is really easy if they're packaged right and unfortunately not everyone knows how to do this so let me give you the long and short of it of where to put these if they're done correctly and then um, if they're not done correctly you'll have to stick them in directly into your um, community folder so uh, but this is the preferred method because it'll make sure everything's gonna work right with the load manager stuff and there is stuff you want to make sure that's working on so uh, we can talk about uh, if there's a a great need I can kind of go into a more in-depth of how to package these correctly uh, but it is a video unto itself for sure so uh, you find this over in uh, my documents I'll open this up over here under my documents is your mad dog X files and in here you have Microsoft 2020 and in there you have liveries this is where you throw all your liveries you can see there's more liveries in here that are showing here and that's because some of these are not packaged correctly so they do not show up if you throw the zip file in here and it doesn't show up here, it's not packaged correctly. Something is missing. Whoever painted it did something wrong. So tough. Um, but if you are going to use it this method, leave it in the zipped format. Don't unzip it. Just leave it in the zip file. You'll then come over here. You'll move the particular aircraft over and hit apply. It's really that simple. And then it will move it over. If you want to uninstall any liveries, the same thing. You just move them to the other side, hit apply and it'll think for a while and it should update and get all that set up in there. Okay, uh, below that, uh, your measurement units for the load manager, not the aircraft, for the load manager only, pounds or kilograms. Uh, this you probably want to have set to whatever you're doing in the aircraft, just so that way there's no back and forth change of whatever, uh, but uh, make sure you know that's for the load manager only. Panel state, uh, it says do not change. Uh, that just means do not change from, you know, whatever it's currently at. The current selected state, cold and dark, closed. This is a one I, I kind of have right there, closed. That means the doors are, it's cold and dark and the doors are closed. There's a cold and dark and the doors are open. So you can pick either one. Uh, ready at gate, ready at takeoff. Once you do that and apply it, this will go back to do not change and it will cho show you what is currently selected. So don't, don't be uh, frightened by that. You can absolutely change them. It just means, you know, don't change this here don't be looking for it here look for it here what the current one is uh cm1 and cm2 avatars uh by the way cm stands for crew member that's uh the way uh, uh least leonardo maybe uh mcdonald douglas does all of their um uh, referring to the captain's position and the first officer's position or the pilot flying the pilot monitoring uh, of course those are fluid but uh, cm1 is always the captain's position cm2 is always the the uh, fo's position and you can set those there and make them visible or not visible in the cockpit. I don't like them, so I have them unchecked. All right. Uh, this is the uh, load man the actual load manager, really, <laughs> the where it gets its namesake from. And uh, this is where you can load the aircraft. Now, again, I would uh, encourage you to not use this if you're using the tablet, because you have this ability in the tablet. And it's a better way to do it in the tablet. However, you need to make the actual changes to the numbers uh, some of them are easier to do in the load manager, but then don't try and do it and confirm it in the tablet because they're going to fight. They're not going to see each other. So it's kind of a weird system, but that's just how it works. This is done by aircraft variant, and, uh, and it does its variant by the tail number. Now, this is very important. If you see settings as we go forward that are not, sh not, they're not the same here, like you set the PMS and it doesn't change in the flight deck, it means you don't have, the, the aircraft is not talking to the system correctly. And the reason for that, more than likely, is you have a custom tail number in your livery customization in Microsoft Flight Simulator, which unfortunately the only way to change is to exit out to the main menu and reload the flight. So 
I would encourage you just leave that blank unless you absolutely have a reason to uh, put the tail number in there. You do not need to put this tail number in the custom tail number section. You just need to leave it blank. Now, you can put this in there, but you better make sure it matches. Otherwise, you're going to have the same problem. The easiest way I always find to check for this is to look right over here on the fuel quantity. I'm going to zoom in here and see how it says pounds. The default aircraft, default default defaults to kilograms so if you have pounds set up over here in your aircraft options which I do right here this is where you change the aircraft units by the way not over here it's right here uh, if you have this set to pounds and you've synced it and all that stuff and this still says kilograms your problem more than likely is that you have um, you have a custom tail number set in your um, livery options so go take care of that. Okay, moving on. Uh, this sh is fairly self-explanatory. It's the uh, number of passengers in the first half of the airplane right here, A. <laughs> uh, area B right here. Um, this is cargo, but you can imagine there's like a split down the middle. It's just the front half of the airplane, the back half of the airplane for a total of 162. Uh, cargo, forward and aft. Now you notice this number here, there's an aft cargo baggages that will automatically update based on the number of passengers you put. So it's accounting for bags. The cargo really is additional cargo that you'd be hauling for the airline. So uh, know that that, so if I change this to zero right here, you notice the uh, baggage number went down because uh, it's doing that automatically. So that is not a changeable number. That's going to assume based on the number of passengers. Uh, cargo's right there. You have your total weights. Uh, DOW is dry operating weight, which is the uh, weight of the aircraft without fuel or payload. Zero fuel weight, which is the aircraft weight of everything minus the fuel. So it's dry operating weight plus payload. And then takeoff weight, really a takeoff weight, this really should say gross weight, but takeoff weight is uh, the weight essentially of everything, the aircraft, the, the payload, and the fuel. Uh, typically, though, takeoff weight is minus the taxi fuel, which I don't think this is accounting for, so just be aware of that. Uh, so you could be down a few hundred pounds, but really in the grand scheme of things, a few hundred pounds isn't going to change much. Uh, over here is the index and center of gravity, and so you have the dry operating index, the zero fuel index, and the takeoff index. These numbers will all update automatically based on what you do up here and what you do down here in the fuel. This number right here is your center of gravity number, your 11.6, and this is the takeoff, and you know that because it's, it's magenta or pink or whatever you want to call this, and it matches this takeoff CG right here. You also have a zero fuel CG. Uh, which really you don't have a reason to reference this for anything in the cockpit, but you do want to make sure it's within limits. And the whole idea is as you burn fuel, the takeoff CG will slowly get closer to the zero fuel CG because obviously you're not losing passengers and baggage during the flight. The only thing you're losing is fuel. So that's what makes these numbers different. So on this chart over here, you'll see your gross weight over on this scale. Down here is your, um, your mean aerodynamic cord percentage, which is what this number is here, uh, down here. And down here are the index units, and then up here as well. And so basically what you would do is, based on your weight, you would find your weight. Again, the, the computer's going to do this for you. But you would find your weight uh, for zero fuel weight, let's say, which is 115,875. Uh, and by the way, hovering over it tells you what the max is, which is kind of nice. And uh, so you can find that right here is roughly here. And the zero fuel index 3208 is right there. So that puts that dot right there. And you can see we're within the limits. We're above the MZFW, which is the max zero fuel limit. And so we are good. You want to kind of stay out of the gray areas. It, it, you're okay in the gray areas, but it's not ideal. By the way, don't worry about this uh, max zero fuel weight limited wing. I, that's for... A configuration of however the wing is limited and I don't believe it's simulated in any way I can't find any documentation on this so just ignore this uh, the other one is the uh, MTO which is maximum takeoff weight and that's pertinent to where the takeoff CG is and again it works the exact same way uh, you want to make sure you're within the limits and below the red line this needs to be below this white line and within the brackets and you'll be set. You'll get this number, which is your takeoff center of gravity uh, number. We'll use that to help compute the takeoff trim later on the flight. We're not gonna talk about it right now. And then down here, you have your fuel left, right, and center. There are three tanks in this aircraft, two, one in each wing and one in the center fuselage. The center fuselage has a uh, capacity of 20,600 pounds. 
The uh, wings have a max capacity of about 9268 each. And uh, the way this aircraft typically works is you burn out the entire center tank first and then burn the wings. So you don't burn them all together. You burn the center all the way down and then the left and right. And again, we'll talk about that later. Okay. You can also import a uh, OFP here from something like Simbri for a PFPX in the uh, right format. And you can also select uh, random loading uh, if you want to potentially as well. But the only way that works and why it's ghosted is because we don't have it set to use the uh, the flight planner uh, in this because I don't use it and I don't necessarily recommend you use it because it's kind of convoluted. There are free things out there like Simbrief. I'm going to point you to those. Use those instead. Moving on down. The technical log. Each aircraft tail number will have a technical log and track how many hours and cycles. The hours obviously is self-explanatory, how long the engines and aircraft has been running, and the cycles is one takeoff and landing. That's a cycle. So uh, you'll get a weekly check expired. You can do the weekly check right here and it will, it will kind of refresh that. There's also better and more fun ways to do it through the tablet, basically simulating maintenance coming out to look and check the aircraft, top off fluids, things like that. Um, you can also do service checks here, APU overhauls, replace the brakes, replace the batteries, and a lot of that is available through the uh, tablet as well. We'll talk about that when we talk about the tablet. Okay, uh, down here is deferred inoperative uh, systems. Now, deferred means they haven't been fixed, but they're okay. They're, they're on the minimum equipment list, so they don't have to be serviceable for flight, but it means you won't have certain things. Now, you can override that and fix them, or you can leave them, and uh, they can be deferred for a certain amount of time, and it just kind of adds to the realism, because that's what the real world does. Sometimes aircraft go out partially serviceable, uh, because it's not always economical to fix every little thing if it's not necessary for the flight um, every time. So, All right, moving on down, the symbol of the aircraft is the airline or airplane-specific, tail number-specific options. So these are only going to change for this tail number. So you can change the tail style from flat to cone, and what that is, is if we go out here, that is this guy right here. This is the flat style. A cone is, well, imagine this as a cone instead of being flat like that. It just comes to a point. I don't like the look of the cone, so I don't use it. So that's why it's not there. Uh, heads up flight display. This is something we just got as an update recently. Now, I don't have it enabled right now because uh, I haven't gotten used to using it. But it will uh, put a big... Uh, Thing right here and add a HUD that'll drop down captain side only and uh, you can fly with a HUD in the uh, MD-80 which I'm assuming was an actual option at one point in uh, probably the later models of the MD-80s. I don't know who uh, availed themselves of that but it's kind of cool. Uh, gear warning inhibit above 1500 radio altitude so if you're above 1500 feet it won't yell at you about you know your gear not being down. It will only do that when you get close to the ground which can be very helpful if you're uh, having to deploy um, some stuff really early for whatever reason. It's just obnoxious to have that going off all the time. Uh, PFD wired to opposite nav. So uh, what that'll do is it will allow the uh, the PFDs to be more in sync with uh, with everything on both sides. Uh, the uh, show armed altitude as flight level. So over here on your FMA, and we'll talk about this uh, again later, but uh, it will show up as a f in flight level numbers is uh, instead of... Uh, instead of just armed. <laughs> so it'll actually show you what your armed altitude is, which I, I appreciate, so that's why that's there. Uh, auto arm altitude. I This is one that will get you uh, when you are flying this aircraft. You have to arm the altitude every time you set it. Uh, if you don't, the aircraft will just fly right through the altitude you set. That's real on the aircraft, and because of that, I leave it off, but you, if that bugs you, you can have it so you don't need to do that, and that's what that auto, auto arm altitude will do. Always play oral when the autopilot disconnects. So every time you play, disconnect the autopilot, you get that beep, beep, beep. Um, I want that because I want to know when the autopilot disconnecting, whether I did it or not. Uh, the EFB, electronic flight bag, that is the tablet. So if you don't have the tablet, then go check that option. Make sure you have the tablet there. Show rising runway. This is on the PFD. It'll show the runway rise up on the PFD as you're getting closer. It's just a nice option. Show ground speed on the PFD. You can see the GS and your speed, so you know beyond what your true air speed is and your indicated air speed, you can have your ground speed. Uh, especially nice for taxiing. Auto brake system. Again, not a required system, but if you want it, uh, there it is. The auto brake right there. I do utilize it in this, in this aircraft. Um, so you can turn that on or off in the load manager. 
Uh, single knob altimeter, that is right here. If you uh, turn that on, you'll get rid of this knob, which is the, uh, the altitude reference knob, which really doesn't do anything in the aircraft. It's more just a reference for you. Um, I just like having it as a backup if I need to set something or a really high uh, MDA or something like that because uh, I think the decision height only goes up to 500. So sometimes that can be helpful. So I like to keep it on two knobs. Uh, TRP with the EPER select option. The TRP is the uh, takeoff uh, reference something or other. Uh, it's basically for setting your, uh, your EPER uh, bugs for takeoff, uh, takeoff flex, go around, cruise, climb, and max continuous thrust. And uh, sometimes they had an EPER select so you could select an actual EPER instead of just an assumed temperature. And so that gives you that option right there and I have that selected. I don't think I've ever used it, but it's there. Uh, heading up in map mode just means you're going to be showing the, the your aircraft's current heading as being up instead of like a weird sideways version, which I think that would be very disconcerting, so I don't, I don't like to not have it that way. And then uh, show wind data on the ND. That'll show you a little uh, wind, wind barb arrow and a speed to give you an idea of what the wind's doing outside. You can also add boarding music, uh, kind of like we have with the Fokker now. Uh, so I don't use this, but uh, it's an option. You can set it here. Um, also, uh, up here, we talked about the tail cone, uh, cockpit units, uh, kilograms and millibars, or um, pounds and inches of mercury. And that the inches of mercury in millibars refers to the altimeter setting, whether your standard altimeter is 2992, like in inches of mercury, or it is um, 1013, like it is in millibars. Uh, but don't worry, because even if you uh, do it the other way, uh, you still have the, al the main altimeter has both, so you can reference either one. So... If you find yourself wanting to fly with pounds, but flying in Europe and you need the 1013, but don't want to use kilograms, you're, you're still okay. It will be fine. Uh, RMA type, DME, VOR, and ADF, or you can do VOR only, or just VOR, ADF, and that is this little instrument right here, which if you're not used to uh, radio navigation flying, I'm going to do a video about this, but uh, this is a very handy tool. Um, in addition to your um, information on the ND, you will have uh, VORs, ADFs, and, uh, and DME information right here, or just VORs, or just VOR ADF, or all three. I like all three because that makes that tool very powerful. Okay, and then finally, your PFD and ND style. You can have a flight director crossbar or triangle, or sorry, or a single queue, and an ND triangle or an ND airplane. That's the reference uh, symbol of your aircraft down here, whether it's a triangle or an actual airplane symbol. Uh, you can have whichever you prefer. Um, I use the triangle and the crossbar because I'm not a big fan of the single queue. I really don't care about the airplane or not, but I, it's the default is triangle and I'm used to it, so it's fine. All right, the gear is now sim in general. So this will not apply to your tail number. This will apply to every aircraft that is an MD-82, uh, whatever the tail number is, okay? So this is for everything. So this is for livery specific. This is for everything. Uh, realistic mode. This is if you want to use failures, maintenance, random variations in loading. This is what you want to check right here. If you don't like any of those things, and especially if you don't like failures, uncheck this. Uh, I fly with failures on all the time. I think it's more fun, but to each their own. Uh, the next one, autopilot disconnects when controls are moved manually. So if you push the yoke or your stick uh, in your physical uh, flight simulator space, uh, it will disconnect the autopilot. Just like in the real world, if you push the uh, yoke uh, too much, it will force the autopilot disconnect. This can be a problem, though, if you have very sensitive or noisy controllers. Uh, or if you just don't like the fact that you can accidentally bump your yoke and disconnect your autopilot. So I leave that off just because I don't want to risk uh, hardware conflicting. And I'm, I have plenty of buttons to disconnect the autopilot quickly, so I'm not worried about it. Uh, automatic update, aircraft weight, center of gravity, and flight number. If you don't want to use the uh, manual loading options through the tablet or the GSX loading options, and you just want to be loaded with whatever, whatever you want immediately, you want to check that. That will automatically, when you when you save the load manager or save the loading in the tablet, it will automatically update the aircraft weight, center of gravity, and flight number. Boom, done, all of it at once. The same thing with the refueled aircraft. That's basically the same thing for fuel. So this doesn't do fuel, this just does the loading, this does the fuel, same thing. Um, so I have those unchecked because I like the GSX integration, that's what I use. Uh, enable pilot monitoring calls. This is the uh, Hill Call V1, rotate, positive rate, gear up, that kind of stuff. 
Uh, enable mouse wheel acceleration. This one's very helpful because if you uh, use your mouse wheel to uh, move these uh, things around, instead of having to scroll for an eternity, if you keep scrolling quickly, uh, that accelerate, it will accelerate and you'll go from like maybe one, two, three, six, seven, nine, ten, and it'll just start going really fast. So you can jump to large um, uh, changes in heading or altitude or speed uh, very quickly if you need to. So that's very helpful. Uh, it can also be annoying for some people, so you can turn on or off. Uh, let's see here. Synchronize the, um, the CM1 and CM2 settings. Uh, so this is basically going to synchronize like your barometer, your barrow, your barrow right here. So if I set 299, uh, not that, <laughs> if I set 2976 here, it sets it automatically over on the CM2 side. Uh, what it does not do is it does not change the standby, so you'll have to change the standby. Um, I'm not sure if there's much else. Oh, it does also change your lighting configuration. So if I turn the panel lighting up on this side. It does the same thing on the CM2 side as well. So stuff that is uh, CM1 specific will affect CM2 the same way. Uh, it's very helpful when you're flying single pilot. If you're flying with a shared, shared cockpit, which I don't think is really set up for this yet, but someday, hopefully, uh, you'll want to turn that off. Uh, synchronized services with GSX Pro. If you don't have GSX Pro, don't turn this on. But uh, this will uh, basically allow you or kind of force you to uh, use GSX to load the aircraft if you don't have these settings on right here. So if you want to load the aircraft via GSX, which I like to do, you want to have that checked. Uh, use PFPX uh, Simbri for uh, fuel and route uh, fuel and route planning. Um, if you're going to use uh, that, you want to turn that on. And we'll talk about that in a second on the tablet where you do that at. And then um, if you're not going to do that, if you're going to do planning through the, uh, the tablet or this manually, turn that off. Uh, turnaround mode. This is uh, basically like state saving, or some people will call this persistence. Um, with the aircraft uh, engine shutdown and the parking brake set, when you exit the sim with this checked, it will remember all the switches and settings and buttons that you have set and will keep them that way in this, in your aircraft for the next flight. So if you like that, I, I generally like to start from cold and dark every time, so I'd turn that off. But that's uh, if you like the persistence thing, that can be really cool, especially if you want to simulate hopping from one area to the other and you're the only pilot that's ever going to fly it. That can be kind of cool. Um, ACARS auto print and auto read. Uh, if you have a physical printer to uh, print your ACARS messages out to, uh, you can do that and set the ACARS printer down here to automatically print to that. Um, but if you don't have them, then don't even worry about it. Uh, filter clamp mode during takeoff. This is kind of a misnomer, but this is very helpful. Let me explain this. So real quick, in, uh, clamp mode or clamp mode is, uh, in a Boeing, it's called throttle hold. But what basically happens is when you, um, you go to set your takeoff power, and we're using, uh, we're using um, uh, auto thrust or auto throttle. So the way this works is before you take off, and I know none of the systems are on right now, so we're just going to simulate this, is we would click the takeoff mode. That would arm takeoff mode on the FMA. We would stand the throttles up to about 50%, let the engine spool up and stabilize. Once the engines are stable, we would go up here and flip on the auto throttle button, which was not going to stick on right now because the systems are off. And the throttles would magically advance to their takeoff power setting, which let's call it right there. Now, if you have physical throttles in your flight deck like I do, you can sometimes have a problem where um, the, the dirtiness of the throttle or the, uh, the noisiness of them can cause the, uh, the throttles to jump back to a different position and to, and to think, oh no, I want to be over here, and you, you fall out of takeoff position. And that's not going to happen initially because the auto throttle's on, so it's going to hold them. But when it gets to, I think it's 60 knots, it goes into clamp. And what that means is the auto, auto throttle servo, servos disconnect. And this happens in most modern aircraft. And the reason for this is so if you need to reject the takeoff, you're not fighting the auto throttle server, servos to pull the thrust back in an emergency. In the simulator, this is even more of an issue because if the, if the throttles, if the servos are on and you don't have the, uh, that option to uh, <clears throat> keep the uh, aircraft from, what is it in here? The autopilot disconnects, flight controls move manually. If you don't have that checked, then nothing you do is going to override this and you, you're barreling down the runway with a bad engine and you can't get the throttles off without reaching up and turning off the autopilot. And you don't want to have to try and do that in an emergency. So um, the, the, 
fix for this is called this filter clamp mode during takeoff. And what it's going to do is once the throttles go into clamp, so the auto, the auto server servos go out, what it does is now the airplane is listening again for your physical throttles. But if they're noisy, that can be a problem because now they could change position suddenly to wherever your throttles are set or do something weird. But what it's going to do, the filter says, I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to look for your throttle inputs, but I'm not going to care what they are unless it's idle. So until I move my throttles all the way back to idle, it's going to ignore them. And then at that point it's going to go, Oh, idle. Got it. So it's a kind of a cool feature to overcome that problem and still allow you to reject all the way up to V1 like they would do in the real world. So I highly suggest you uh, turn that on if you have uh, physical uh, throttles for your hardware. Um, over on this side, cockpit lighting tuning, um, or lightning tuning, I guess is, a, is that what that says? Lightning? Yeah, it is. Uh, it means lighting. Uh, <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, anyway, you can, you can change the, the various brightness of different things, uh, their, their maximum settings and how they, how they work. Obviously the knobs work to control those things. And so I've never had to touch that. I think the, the cockpit lighting is just fine the way it is, but if you find something is like too bright or not bright enough, there's some things you can change here. Um, additional options. This is where if you have SimBrief, you can put the pilot ID in there so that way the tablet will bring down your SimBrief um, files automatically if you say import from SimBrief. If you use Pushover, which from what I understand I think has to do with, uh, it's like a virtual printer for printing ACAR stuff, uh, you can put your um, credentials in there. And Hoppy ACARs, if you want to use CPDLC and things through the um, FMC here with, uh, with these, you can do that. So that's where you put that information in. And then access calibration. Um, so a, a quick note here, and this video is getting a little bit long, so I'm going to try to make this short. Uh, but a quick note here, the way the aircraft flies by default is uh, based on tab control flight controls. So you're not uh, directly moving. And it's going to be best to demonstrate this by going out here. Uh, the ailerons is where this is most apparent. So this is your aileron over here. Oops. There we go. Sorry. I'm trying to find the right position there. This is your aileron, this big thing here. But these are the tabs. This is actually what you're flying with the yoke. And these things are going to deflect opposite of what you're going to do here, and it's going to fly the aileron into position. And all this means, they're not hydraulically controlled. These tabs are controlled by wires and pulleys. And what this means is you end up having to have quite a bit of deflection. And so you can see I can move this now without hydraulics because all it's moving is the tab. But you have to have quite a bit of deflection to get this thing to move in the direction you want it to. And it's even less, you know, usable at low speed. So the lower the speed, the more input you're going to have to get to fly that aileron. Uh, talking to a real life MD-80 pilot. He said the MD-80 was the only aircraft he ever found himself having to go hard over on the yoke uh, to make inputs in certain situations. Um, so whereas on other aircraft you might do very small inputs on the yoke, uh, this one is not out of characteristic to be going hard, not completely hard over necessarily, but to be going very large uh, corrections to get the uh, plane to roll effectively. And same thing with the, uh, the elevator as well, because it is tab controlled as well. So given that, um, if you have something like a joystick that does not have a lot of travel from its neutral point to its far left to far right compared to a 90 degree yoke, uh, you may find you need to make some adjustments because you're going hard over very easily or you're not, it, it, does, it feels like you have to go a long ways before it even starts to be effective and it can really feel funny on a stick. So if you're using a flight stick, you may have to manipulate that a little bit. Uh, if you're using a yoke and it feels like you're throwing the controls around, that's actually probably pretty legit. So um, don't be frustrated by that. But here's where you can um, kind of change the sensitivities and the scales of the different uh, things if you need to within this outside of Microsoft itself or SPAD or Axes and O's if you're using something like that. I have never had, to, I, I've never felt the need to touch this. So this is just how it is by default. Okay. And the last thing on the uh, load manager here is the failures. Uh, and so again, if you have turned off realistic mode, this doesn't matter. In fact, I don't, does it, uh, 
No, it doesn't ghost it. I wasn't sure if it did. Um, so this just sets the failure rate. So light failures, which is going to be nuisance failures, um, happen here. Um, just think of this as a kind of an exponentially larger scale of time. It doesn't mean it's going to wait a thousand hours before it actually does it, but in the in the grand scheme of things, the Sims making some assumptions about the probability of a failure. And so your more serious failures are going to happen here, and then dangerous failures, this is going to be like engines flaming out and stuff like that, are going to happen as the most rare. Um, so you could also turn these all the way up to infinity, which is kind of the same thing, I guess, as turning off realistic mode. So maybe if you want to do maintenance and random variations and stuff, but don't want failures, you could turn that on and then move these up to infinity, I guess. Um, but there you go. That's an option. Okay. So that is a, a quick overview of the, uh, the load manager. Again, you should only really have to mess with this when you're first loading in your uh, sim, uh, as far as the first time or a, a loading in a new variant for the first time is really the only time you need to mess with this. And then obviously don't forget to, uh, save and update any changes you make, uh, when you're done. Now, I will touch on the tablet real quick before we uh, end this video, which is already uh, getting longer than I was hoping it was going to be. And that's why I'm talking fast, so I apologize. I want to try and keep these uh, videos uh, between 30 and 40 minutes as best I can, but there's a lot to go into. Um, so I'm not going to go too far in depth in this, but I do want to point out, here's that weight and balance, and you can import the OFP from a file, you can import from SimBrief, and do that all right here, or you can change the numbers and values right here as well. So you do not need to use the load manager to do that. I recommend doing it on the tablet. It's just better to keep it all here. So, and then obviously in the aircraft services, this is where you can open the doors. The forward main door can open there. Uh, cargo doors, aft main, aft stairs. The stairs will deploy with no hydraulics, but they won't raise without hydraulics. So uh, be aware of that. Um, over on the ground side of things, I will click. There we go clicking on something else um the gpu you you uh it's active when it's blue and uh, you can see it it's already active here i can't undo it here or add it here because i have gsx integration so if you want to get the gpu with gsx you've got to bring up your gsx menu that's flow by the way that's not what this video is about but uh you can get your gsx menu from the normal stupid top menu if you have that uh but under additional services uh dismiss gpu and then it would be you know, attach GPU or call GPU or whatever it is here uh, through GSX. You could do that there. Uh, you can add the AC, which is not, um, it's not physically, but why is that not? I don't know why that's, that shouldn't be acting as a button, but it's doing something funny. The AC is not uh, modeled. I think at some point there's a plan to do that, but it's not done yet, but it, it will simulate having uh, AC come in from the, uh, from either a cart or like the jetway, which is that guy right there. Uh, so if you don't have the APU and you, it's a hot day, you can get AC that way. And then maintenance just will open things on the aircraft, like the engine doors, the engine cowls, radome. This is all for looks uh, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, one last thing I will talk about on the tablet real quick, and that's the technical log. This is where you can do those weekly checks outside the load manager I talked about. And you can also request uh, things to be fixed. You can report malfunctions. If you lose something in flight, it's not going to automatically populate the list. You have to tell the maintenance guy, hey, we lost this do something about it um, you can see the deferred defects here you can see a history of the aircraft the stuff you've lost and fixed over time it's pretty cool and it'll show you the weekly check the last check all that stuff all right there which is pretty cool and this you can notice this is custom obviously the uh, the american airlines uh, thing it will default to like a lame image of like a nebula or something um, so you see my logo back up in there. So I've added uh, custom backgrounds for all my uh, tablets for this aircraft. And if you want to know where to add those at, I will show you. So you're going to go into your community folder and you are going to go down to the main Mad Dog aircraft one, which is LSH, Leonardo Softhouse. There'll be a number of liveries down here. Ignore those. The FSX, the FX, ignore that. Go into the main aircraft one. You're going to go up here to aircrafts. And here's where you're going to see the CFGs, the MDA files for all the various liveries you have installed. And all you need to do is create a, uh, um, an image, a PNG image, and name it the exact same thing as the tail number for which you want to apply it to and throw it in here. So you'll probably only see one. Um, you'll, you'll see this guy, the ILEOX, which is the default um, tail number for the aircraft, for the default aircraft. So uh, 
you can open this up and just copy this file into a paint program, paint over it or you get the dimensions off it, save the new PMG, uh, PNG as the uh, correct uh, tail number. In this aircraft's case, it is uh, N9406 Tango and make sure that's called N9406 Tango.png, throw it in the file, reload the sim and bada boom, there you go. So I have one for Legion, I have one for American, I have one for Delta and so on and so forth. So that's how you do that. Okay, that is where we're going to end this video. I know it was a little bit longer than I was hoping for, but that gives you a good introduction into the aircraft, how to get it loaded up, and how to uh, configure the various options. In the next module, we're going to go into uh, more start talking about systems and uh, actually loading the aircraft up and kind of doing a cockpit overview of where everything is. Again, don't forget to follow me on uh, Twitch at uh, twitch.tv forward slash Mustafa. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe to this video and uh, the other video series. I really appreciate it. It helps get the uh, stuff out there. And I uh, just really want to be a help of trying to learn this aircraft because I really like this aircraft. It's kind of a sleeper aircraft. It's not really well loved, used in the uh, in the community. It's more all about A320s and, and 737. So I want to try and get some love to the, uh, the good old uh, McDonnell Douglas because it's a great simulation. It's so in-depth is this aircraft very highly study level it has some faults on sounds it has its faults in textures the textures are fixed uh for the cockpit at least by going to to there's some uh there's some uh um, mods for that and in uh ft sim plus has a fantastic sound mod that will make these jtads sound like jtads so links will be in the description for those sites highly recommend going and get the uh, sound pack you can get for two bucks. It's a subscription to Patreon for two bucks. Get the subscription, download all the mods you want, and then cancel it if you want. Um, I keep my subscription going to, to support the guy because he does great work. But uh, if, you, if you're short on cash and you just need the one, uh, you can totally get it for two bucks. And there you go. What a, what a great sound mod for that. So, Okay, that's going to do it for this uh, video. Hopefully uh, this was helpful. Any questions you have, please uh, feel free to join the Discord and ask there, or uh, just put a comment down in the comment section below, and I will be happy to try and uh, do my best to answer those and uh, get you all squared away. Until next time. <laughs>